do you recognize that Christmas carol? Yeah, it's Thou Didst Leave Thy Throne. And that song is going to provide the framework for our conversations this week on Discover the Word. Because Thou Didst Leave Thy Throne is going to take us to a biblical text that is not normally in the Christmas text rotation for this time of year. Pull a chair up and discover how this song and the passage it points us to fill in the all-important Christmas backstory. Yeah, hi, I'm Brian Hedinga, and it's great to have you here at the table for our Christmas week conversations on Discover the Word, the weekday small group Bible study from Our Daily Bread Ministries. The entire regular group is together for this week, Marty Hahn, Elisa Morgan, Bill Crowder, and Daniel Ryan Day. And it's Bill who will be leading the discussion, which, as I said, is built around the Christmas song, Thou Didst Leave Thy Throne, and a passage not normally connected with Christmas in Paul's New Testament letter to the Philippians. We're calling this week the Christmas Backstory, because Bill is convinced that when we think about Christmas and Jesus' birth at this time of year, we so often enter the story too late. And you'll see what he means by that. We enter the story too late as we get into our study in just a moment. But first, Bill and Mart and Elisa and Daniel are going to talk about the concept of backstory and why in most everything in life, knowing it makes a huge difference. Let's listen. What do you think of the word backstory? Context. Yeah, or yeah. sometimes I think the rest of the story, the story before the story. Okay, which is... Yeah, the prequel. The prequel. There you go. That's Those good. are all good mm-hmm. words. What would be some examples? When the Olympics come around, they do these beautiful stories about who this particular athlete is. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah what it took to get to that mm-hmm. place. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The backstory. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, a lot of TV shows, whether it's uh, singers or business people that are trying to win a contract or something like that, they'll go and they'll show their hometown and their house and maybe Mm -hmm. a little bit about the business Mm -hmm. and their kids Mm -hmm. and why they decided to go into whatever it is that they're doing. I think about a lot of these home improvement programs Uh where, you know, you see this dilapidated house that's been ignored for 30 years. And then you see what they do with it and what they turn it into, but you don't really appreciate the what they turn it into mm-hmm. unless you see what it was before. Mm-hmm. Now look at this kitchen. That's now, really you know, good, so, Bill. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it I takes on a stuff. whole different meaning yeah. because you have that context. Yeah. So we're going to talk about a backstory this week and maybe the most important backstory of all because I have long been of the opinion that most of the time when we come to the Christmas story, we enter the story too late. Mm. Maybe we enter it in Bethlehem with the baby in the manger and the angels and the shepherds. Maybe we enter it in Luke chapter one in Nazareth with the announcement. But there's a whole lot of backstory that not only predates those things, it also predates creation. Hmm. The more we understand the backstory, the more we'll appreciate who that baby is that's laying in that manger. Does that make sense? Sure. So that's what we want to look at this week. And we're going to look at a specific text that we don't normally gravitate to at Christmas time. It's Philippians chapter two. And while you're going there, this idea of entering the Christmas story too late was also something that resonated with a woman back in Victorian England. Her name was Emily Elizabeth Steele Elliott. Emily Elliott was a daughter of an Anglican clergyman. She worked with at-risk kids, that's what we would call them today, through a Sunday school program in her father's church. And she was trying to think of a way to communicate the Christmas story to these street kids without much context, to use your word, Daniel. And she decided to write a hymn. Now, it's kind of a good instinct for her because her aunt was Charlotte Elliott, who wrote Just As I Am. So it ran in the family. Yeah. (laughs) So she decided to write a hymn that didn't start in Bethlehem and didn't start in Nazareth. The opening line to the hymn says, Thou didst leave thy throne and thy kingly crown when thou camest to earth for me. Mm-hmm. That's a very different starting place, isn't it? It's far greater than the advent that we usually think of, right? I mean, we think we're anticipating Christmas mm-hmm. in that whole season. Mm-hmm. I like that you use that word, Mart, advent, because really, if we look at it the way you're suggesting, Bill, if we back up all yeah. the way before creation, mm-hmm. The whole world has been waiting yeah. for this reality, mm-hmm. and it's so much more cosmic. Yeah. yeah, I almost picture when we go on a trip, there's all that stuff that happens at the house before you leave for the airport. So it's like packing your bag and all that stuff. And it's almost like we're talking about that time where 
you know, God and Jesus are talking to each other and getting ready for Jesus to come to earth. For me, though, it messes everything up. Yeah. Once I start backing up that far, yeah. all of a sudden I start having questions and I just kind of start to unravel. Yeah. <laughs> you know, okay, you go back. Okay, what about before that and before right. that? And all of a sudden you're thinking about something that's unthinkable. And I think, you know, I love that you just said that because we have this linear conception of time and I'm not sure God does. He doesn't perhaps be limited in the same way we are with, you know, the timeline. Isn't it more of a dot that he is all things at once? And You're so, not helping me. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but that is the idea of the word I am, yes, the name I am. It's ongoing. And Jesus actually said that when he said, God's the father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He was telling them, you know, your thinking is not going far enough. And I hear what you're saying too, Mart. I think that any time we try to look back of creation, we're trying to look back into something for which we don't have a lot of reference right. points. Mm. But Philippians 2 does give us some scriptural reference points that we can at least begin to think about things that are mysterious and are clearly beyond us. It's stretching us. We need to be stretched beyond the, yeah. the cradle. I think that's exactly right because otherwise we end up with a very simplistic view of the most extraordinary event we could ever try to imagine. Mm -hmm. So that's where Philippians 2 comes in. Because surprisingly, Paul gives us, in somewhat theological language, the Christmas backstory. Hmm. He goes back behind the manger, behind the announcement, behind the promises of the Old Testament, behind the promise of Genesis chapter 3 that the seed of the woman would crush the serpent's head, behind creation itself, all the way back to an agreement between the Father and the Son in eternity past, that they would rescue the world before they'd even made that world. And before the world had even fallen? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's extraordinary because in one sense, it encases God's love in a whole new set of parameters when you think of it, that not only did he love the world so much that he sent his Son, he loved the world so much that he decided to send his son before he'd even made the world and given it permission to choose its own way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It must be that because in anticipation of our freedom mm -hmm. to choose, mm -hmm. that he knew what we would do with that. Yeah. And he knew that we could end up with an even greater awareness of his love than if we hadn't fallen. That's the best guess. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, I mean, I agree with it's you. It's got to be something like that. It has to be something like that. We can't. You know, how do we understand the mind of God? Well, and that brings up a good point. I think it goes back to what you mentioned, Mart, about going back and back and back and ending up in a place where you're really confused. Even this passage that we're getting ready to talk about is a passage that's been controversial in the church for a long time. People haven't always agreed on what it means that Jesus empties himself and comes to earth and what that agreement looks like. And so I think it's okay for us to sit in that tension mm -hmm. as we kind of look at what Paul is describing here. Mm. Yeah. What's so interesting, you know, we talked about Emily Elliott's hymn. Scholars believe that as she was using a hymn to try to instruct these street kids without context, Paul is using a hymn, and some scholars even think that he wrote this hymn hmm. himself, to communicate to the Philippians this Christmas backstory. It actually goes verses 5 through 11. Let's read the whole thing, even though we're going to concentrate mostly this week on verses 5 through 8. So Philippians chapter 2, start with verse 5, and then we'll stop at verse 11. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a person, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now there you have the whole... We should be able to sing this. Mm -hmm. Now... We're going to examine those verses 5 through 8, the remainder of this week. But before we do, we're talking about backstory. So let's get the backstory to this. And that's Philippians 2, 1 through 4, okay. in which he describes everything he longs for in that congregation. Now, how can...